And I've also reached a natural barrier, the third cataract. One of a series of impassable rapids that hinder all Nile travelers. My felucca can go no further. Drum! And as if to rub in the point, on the cliff high above the cataract, there is an old inscription, warning of danger ahead. This was the original border between ancient Egypt and the Nubian province of Kush. Tomorrow, I join the trail of another warrior whose imperial ambition ran headlong into that of another would-be African pharaoh. I'm about to enter the land of Kush. The following day, sunrise is obliterated by a desert storm. Minute grains of sand and dust get in your eyes and up your nostrils. Sandstorms like this are commonplace in the Sudan and most of North Africa, and they don't make a photographer's life any easier. I'm on the Nile on my way to Dongola, where I hope to catch an old steam ferry. In it, I hope to travel to Karima, round the great S-bend of the Nile. I'm on another felucca, dwarfed by this mighty river. And it was past this very spot, nearly 3,000 years ago, that the black pharaohs launched their invasion north. Now wind the clock forward to just over a century ago and we find that history repeats itself. In 1896, a conquering army also sailed past this very spot. But this one was heading south. In the 1800s, a man was born near here who believed he was sent by God. He was a sort of Islamic messiah known as the Mahdi. He too had visions of a black African empire, this time an Islamic one. Today, his followers still whip themselves into a frenzy in his memory. They're called dervishes. One hundred and twenty years ago, a dervish army launched a holy war to end British colonial rule. They killed the British commander, General Gordon, at Khartoum. It was ten years before his death would be avenged. And when vengeance came, it came in the form of this man, Lord Kitchener, later to become one of Britain's most outstanding generals. Kitchener was determined to destroy the dervish army. And to get at them, he used the River Nile. The next morning, we arrive in Dongola. Ah, Dongola. Ah, Dongola. Fantastic. And it was near Dongola, in 1896, that Kitchener's army first came under fire from the dervish forces. He quickly defeated them with superior firepower. Are these uh, the ferry boats? Do they stay for k Karima? No, no, it's, it's finished. No, no, no. Ah. Well, there's my Nile ferry. Thanks to irrigation and droughts upstream, the river level is low. The result is that these once magnificent old boats have been left to rust in the mud. 
so my plan to travel under steam, like Lord Kitchener, won't work. It's a riverboat graveyard. This is all that's left of a riverboat culture that grew up along the Nile. It was based on British imperial power, but it was romantic just the same. Imagine what it would have been like living on these riverboats for days on end. Really like Agatha Christie and Death on the Nile. First class passengers would have been reclining in these lovely little cabins, drinking their gin and tonics, while the Sudanese all rode down below. It's still about 500 miles down to Khartoum, and it would have been quite a long trip, but in a boat like this, in those days, would have been wonderfully luxurious. The Battle of Dongola was Kitchener's first success. Dongola is famous for its markets, stacked with produce from the Nile. Today, as in 1896, there's enough food to feed an army. And it's in these markets that I meet Ramadan. Ramadan is also bound for Karima. He tells me there's only one way to get there quickly but it means abandoning the river and going by bus. So how long does the bus take to get to Karima? Uh, two days. Yeah? Yeah, we take two days and desert and many sand and, uh -huh. yeah. But Karima is very beautiful also. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. looking forward to it. And yeah. Jabal Barkar. Jabal Barkar and there is a pool also. But yeah, and you, you were stopping in Karima? Yeah, we stopped in Karima, yeah. That's the good news. The bad news is that the bus doesn't leave until the day after tomorrow. So it's two days waiting. Yeah, yeah. Days waiting. There's not many buses in this country. Yeah, you must yeah. wait until that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Say shukra. Shukra. <laughs> the Sudanese are a nation of tea drinkers. So we discuss travel plans so over a glass of sweet minted tea. Is there much to see around Dongola? No. Dongola is also famous for its cooking. Perhaps I can relax and enjoy some Sudanese cuisine. But Ramadan suggests another form of cooking. You may think that being buried 30 kilometers out in the desert is some sort of Sudanese torture. Actually, it's uh, something that a lot of people travel a long way to do because this sand has incredible properties. And anybody with rheumatism who gets buried here for an hour or two walks away with almost no pain. Well, for me, because I don't have rheumatism, this is actually like a hot sauna. Well, probably in an hour or two, I'll just be nicely baked. But uh, it actually is very pleasant, I think. Ramadan, could you grab my hat? I'm going to fry out here. Thanks, mate. How long do I have to stay out here? Ah, what do you want? Two hours, three hours, no problem. I think I'll be cooked like a turkey. <laughs> it reminds me of an ancient funereal custom of the black pharaohs. When a pharaoh died, he expected all his wives, courtiers, guards and palace staff to be buried with him, alive. getting hot, very hot. Soon I'll be mummified like a pharaoh. They put a cover over me as the sun rises higher and higher in the desert sky. And by now, I seem to have acquired quite an audience. But I can't let them watch me cook forever. We must get back to Dongola. We've got a bus to catch. It's a 200-mile journey, which means a 12-day camel ride with a caravan. I'm very glad we've got a place on this bus. Yeah. 